Hello and welcome to what is going to be a bit of a blog style update for this Friday. So a lot of stuff has been happening behind the scenes and it hasn't really made it into the recent video. So I wanted to get you up to speed on some of the things like the machine, uh, some of the projects and things like that. So everyone's on the same page and we've got an idea of what's going to be happening and why things are happening in the way that they are. Additionally, I want to go over something that's, I think, quite important, to, certainly to me at least, which is the way that Autodesk has changed the personal license for Fusion 360. So if you follow any of the other maker channels around, this has been quite a big deal over the last week and a half since they announced it. Um, there's been an awful lot of confusion as to what these changes will actually mean for enthusiasts, as well as what's the future for this package? Should you maybe choose something else or just rough it along and change the way you do things? So obviously Fusion 360 is vital to what I do and it's quite a big deal for a lot of you guys as well. So many, many people use it um, because it's a fantastic piece of software that's freely available. But of course, it becomes less fantastic when features start getting chopped up and locked away. So I'm gonna be giving my opinions on that a little bit later. So if you do want to just tune in for the Autodesk discussion, we've got timestamps below, so you can just skip to that bit. But first, we're just gonna jump into what's on the table here because this concerns my broken CNC machine. And let's see what's happening with that. Now, if you've been following the community tab, you will have seen that I got one of these, which is a ball screw to replace my broken one. Now, I say broken ball screw, the actual ball screw itself, I don't think is damaged, but the ball nut, I think, has some hefty debris in there, likely an aluminium chip or something, because there's not a whole lot of protection on this. It doesn't have like a spiral cover or anything, so it does leave it open for things like that. And unfortunately, it does mean it's completely locked in place. I don't really know how to get it off. I might be able to just force it off, but then I'd still need a new ball screw assembly, um, or at least a ball nut assembly to put onto the ball screw. Either way, it's not particularly easy. So you'd think that, you know, oh, new ball screws arrive, swap it over. Nice and simple, eh? No, 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 2020 got to this as well. It turns out that the ball screw that has been sent is a gloriously upgraded one. In fact, this is made by a uh, Swiss company. I cannot pronounce the names. I will not try to, I'll pop it up on the screen instead. But they make this screw and assembly and it is wonderful. It's so smooth. And I've added some silicone grease on this one already because I was going to just put it in the machine before I found the, the issue. Um, the problem is that it's actually a completely different size. It's the same length in Y, so it's the same um, total length, but um, the diameter is completely different. It's actually two millimeters smaller than the original one. And it's uh, again, two millimeters smaller for the ball nut as well, which means it will not interface with the thread I have on the machine. Yeah, that's a bit of a problem there. So I'm currently working with the manufacturer, just sort of communicating, figure out what's happened. So it's, it's possible that maybe this one comes from one of their higher end machines um, and as such has a different fitment and then haven't actually sent the one which is necessarily for my lower end one. Uh, there's also a possibility that maybe they made some revisions, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, we will work through that one eventually. It's it's not something which isn't going to be fixable, but it is interesting seeing the differences. I would very much prefer to use this one because it does feel lovely. It's got a really lovely action to it, but if it doesn't fit, it's no good. Now, I've had a few comments already about why not 3D print an adapter for this? Well. The problem there is that 3D printed items, unless you have something like an SLS a nylon printing machine or a metal printer, even better, are just, they're just rubbish. I mean, they're going to just flex and I can tell there's going to be loads of problems. It's not even worth considering, unfortunately, because this is quite a lot of weight. You know, the, the weight of the spindle moving left and right pretty rapidly, that will wear down a print ridiculously fast. Plus, this is a very fine thread, this. So even if I pushed it in and I sort of made it fit, I, it just wouldn't work very well in the long run and it would quickly degrade. Maybe an SLS nylon one would work you know, for a bit longer. I'd still not be comfortable with it, but nylon is ridiculously strong and I'd be much more comfortable with an SLS one just because it has a, a much tighter bond. So perhaps that would be an option. But then if I'm paying to have something printed, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I might as well just buy a new thing to go on it instead. Now, unfortunately, my lathe being as rubbish as it is, if I were clever and I'm someone like Abom79, so Adam, I could just make one. Uh, I can't really do that. I mean, the, the internal threading on this is very fine um, and it would be quite a challenge, I think. And also, this isn't a very big um, part. It's not very long and it's actually got quite a thin wall, so it would be a little bit challenging. It is, of course, possible. 
but maybe a bit beyond my skill level and uh, combined with my machine, I think. Needless to say, this is a bit of a ball weight. <coughs> so the machine is still out of action for a bit longer. Hopefully not for much longer because everything sort of hinges upon it. So you've been asking about where are the Aquacaris updates? Well, I mean, I can't really do any of the up updates when I can't actually make the thing. And the same thing goes for Ensys, actually. Both of those projects are very CNC heavy. So not having a working CNC does present quite a few problems. Once we're back up in operation, uh, we'll be able to get some project stuff going, which will be nice. And so, of course, we have to give you an update on Aquacaris because it's been sat on the bench this whole time in the background of the videos. And I keep getting so many comments asking, where is it? Where, where are my updates? What's going on? Where, is the build going to be finished? Is it ever going to go on? Well, fear not, it will. I mean, actually, we've got some really cool stuff aligning with this one that I think you're going to love. So, firstly, a viewer got in touch uh, talking about machining one of the heat sinks for the DDCs because obviously, you know, the DCs don't quite match up in the way that they are. So, I thought it'd be cool to make some heat sinks for those. And very kindly, he's gone in touch and offered to make one on a rather serious Herco mill. Uh, so I'm quite excited for that. Um, I'll give you more details when we're a little bit closer when he's had time, because obviously this is a real machine shop. They've got other commitments and this is being done on the side. So I'm very, very grateful. And when that can actually happen and when I can get my own machine to make my own one and finish it up when uh, theirs arrives, that would be really special because I think having a piece of community made um, input on this case, I know, that seals the deal for me and it's an absolutely wonderful offer and I thank you so so much and I'm really looking forward to doing the video on that one because it's going to be a load of fun I think. If I can even get close to machining one to the quality that uh, is likely going to turn up then I will be very chuffed indeed. Now the next update is this because this is a 2080 Ti. Now yeah the 3090 did sort of happen, um, but did you see the 3090 launch? There's a whole lot of... <laughs> Nobody got a 3090. There aren't any. They're like gold dust. In any case, eventually I will be getting one because actually it suits my needs perfectly. Um, so one of the things I did cut my teeth on originally was doing ArcViz, ProductViz and that sort of thing. So actually I do love to do a lot of rendering and I'd love to be able to do more animation work. Unfortunately, at the moment, uh, it's very, very resource intensive. Now, if you're accustomed to um, optics rendering, so in Blender using cycles, I use cycles most of the time, um, optics is incredibly powerful. The speed gains from being able to use the ray tracing cores in the RTX cards is immense. That's why I wanted this card here to begin with. Um, but the 3090 is a bit insane on that front, largely because it has 24 gigs of VRAM, and that's really important because you need to be able to load your entire scene into it otherwise uh, you're going to be sharing it with the CPU and everything and you actually slow down a lot when you do that so I'd rather keep everything in the GPU so for me personally that's a big deal so obviously I want to then put a 3090 but I need to get a 3090 in see my predicament so what we're going to do is we're going to take a time I'm going to focus on the other projects and then when I can get a 3090 and fit it into the project we can do that, uh, rework whatever needs to be redone. Maybe I need to make a, re a new panel. Well, I can do that. Yeah, it would take a while, but it's not a big deal to get the right finish and get the right card going. I'm all for that. Plus, there's some really cool designs for 3090 water blocks coming out, especially for the Founders Edition ones. So I'm really excited to see how I might be able to work one of those into the design in a different way to how this one was going to be. Additionally, this radiator has to go. As we know, this is broken, it's a piece of rubbish. So I'm probably going to be replacing that with an aqua computer one, which is going to be needing a whole load of extra machining. I'll have to make a whole new distro plate, not a big deal. But the adapters are completely different. So this can just go straightly into a distro. If, uh, if I look at one of the aqua computer ones, actually they work in a completely different way. It's quite interesting. So I'm probably going to make an adapter which then fits onto a plate, but that'll be a whole new video and it'll be quite an exciting one. But again, we need to save that for when I can actually machine things and get things going. Also, you may have seen these Lian Li fans that um, stick together. Now, I was thinking that's actually perfect because they have a sort of a white silver version. Uh, yeah, this is white slash silver. You know, I think that would work pretty well if you ask me. We actually saw them at Computex uh, a year and a half ago, 2019, um, and they were really quite exciting in their early prototype stage back then. Now they're actually out, so we can give them a go, and I think that would be 
pretty spot on for this particular theme, if at least for just the side mounted radiator rather than the front one in case that one's not visible. Either way, yeah, it's an interesting avenue to explore, so it's definitely on the tables. Lastly, before we jump into Fusion 360 talk, I just want to cover Ensys briefly because this is another build that was greatly affected by the CNC breakage. So what I've basically gone and done is taken the whole thing back to the drawing board and started afresh with a different set of materials in mind. So originally I was going to be using, again, lots and lots of aluminium because I do love the way it comes out. However, the biggest problem with aluminium is that on my machine, it takes forever and it is incredibly arduous. So what I decided to do is instead of using lots and lots of aluminium, I'm going to scale it back to use aluminium in the key structural areas where it really makes sense. And then I'm going to use a lot more frosted and clear acrylic instead. And then the good thing about that is I can cut those materials far, far more easily. And also I can do cool other things like 3D contouring and stuff. So if you remember, I said I wanted to go with this blade aesthetic. I'm going to try and see if I can work that into the acrylic. So add these sort of lovely long chamfers using the ball mill, and that should be pretty exciting. And additionally, I can then put lighting inside the panels. Now, given there's a lot of lighting inside this board, I think it could be pretty cool to be able to have lighting effects sort of transition from the board into the chassis so that the whole thing pulsing. And that should be really exciting. Now, in addition to the frosted panel, I want to try inlaying them with white acrylic and aluminium as well. So we should get some nice material contrast in there. And I think it should come out really well. So fingers crossed I can actually get the machine going and get that working for us because then this build will go from 0 to 60 really fast. <laughs> Off myself my brew. Let's have a chat about Fusion 360. Now I'd just like to start out by mentioning that uh, Angus over at Makers Muse did a fantastic video earlier in the week on this subject matter where he also covered some of the alternatives to Fusion 360. So if in the wake of the update you've decided that uh, you'd rather look elsewhere, uh, I definitely recommend giving his video a watch because he's got some fantastic options in there uh, and actually I learned an awful lot as well. So even if you want to continue using Fusion 360, I definitely recommend watching the video because there could be some pretty cool things that could work for your workflow. Now, like Angus, I do actually pay for my Fusion 360 license because for me, it offers really quite astounding value. So if you compare it to something like SolidWorks, a license might be 10 times the cost of Fusion per annum. And that's a really, really big deal, perhaps even more than 10 times when you take into account extensions. So the fact that I can get a fully fledged CAD software with CAM built in, plus with the analysis tools and things like generative design for what I'm paying per annum is pretty decent. Now, for a hobbyist who's maybe not earning directly from the package itself, I can see that being a much bigger pill to swallow, especially considering that you can't actually purchase a perpetual license. And this brings us to problem one with what they've done. An inherent issue with subscription-based software is that you don't have any direct control over it. And not only that, you're basically operating under the goodwill of the company that provides it which means they are free to change things at their whim, which could mean adding in new pricing structures above yours where all of the new features go, or at the very worst, taking something that was on your package and then transferring it to a higher priced option, essentially holding your utility to ransom, which is of course no good. There's a lot of trust that has to be there. Now this is the issue with changing the free license here in my opinion, because basically Autodesk has eroded this trust. They've shown that they're willing to remove features and put them into a different price bracket. So I think a lot of people who are on the same price bracket that I'm operating at are now thinking that, well, what happens if they take some of these features that we had and then put them into a premium model? Because there did used to be an ultimate package, for instance. So it's a very real concern and it's actually one that I've been considering myself as well. I'd rather not have a subscription service I'd rather have a perpetual license, but they don't offer one. So I'm in a bit of a quandary there. And at the same time, I can really see how lots of people would find this off putting, even if they're not going to be making money from it. They just don't want to have their files essentially held to ransom uh, because 
functionality gets shifted around between price brackets. So that in itself is a bit of a problem and it's something that I think is going to be quite difficult for Autodesk to fix easily because trust once lost is pretty hard to earn back usually. Now the first of the big feature changes that we need to look at is the 10 active document limit. Quite frankly, this just feels like an arbitrary gate that they've stuck in front of enthusiasts to make it difficult for them. Now normally you could just open up any number of documents at once, uh, which means that if you had very old projects, you could just open them up like normal. The new way for personal license holders is going to be you have to archive your old documents so that they're no longer active and then you activate a document and then you can open it. Now to me this sounds like an issue with all the cloud integration that the software has meaning that obviously opening and closing documents and keeping everything open probably uses a lot of cycle time for them. The problem here though is of course you can very, very easily get past 10 open documents. You may not have 10 windows open, but if you've got, say, a, a medium, sort of smallish assembly even, and you've made it out of individual parts, you can easily exceed 10 for that. Now, they did clarify that if you have an assembly with multiple parts, they don't all need to be active. You obviously will not be able to work on more than 10 at once, but you can then deactivate some of them and open them up um, when they've been activated again. So. It is workable, you will be able to manage things, but at the same time, I just it just sounds like an absolute faff. And I don't like the idea of basically putting in a gate to encourage people to go up rather than offer lots of incentives. Aside from just being impractical, I think there's also a potentially worrisome side effect from all of this, and that's workflow and best practices. As you may know, there are multiple ways that you can use CAD and the two major methods are a bottom-up approach and a top-down approach. And let's take a look at what those both mean. Now, a bottom-up approach is essentially the classic CAD experience, where you start with individual components and then you put them into an assembly file. And this is chiefly how SolidWorks, Inventor, and PTC Creo, etc. operate. Now, it's a very robust way of doing things because you don't have a lot of codependencies. And it's also very good for parametric modeling because you can have a huge parameter list and then you just dip in and out of it between all the files that are going to be inside your assembly. So this makes it really good if you're working with a lot of people, for instance, where one person might work on one component or a sub-assembly and you can put them all together and work from that. Now, the issue here, though, is it can be very difficult to work to a particular form sometimes. Because you're having to work with all the detail to begin with, actually that can be quite difficult and sometimes you want to work the other way around. So for that, there is the top-down approach. So top-down, like you would imagine, is almost the opposite of the bottom-up approach, where instead of having lots and lots of individual files that you pull together, you actually start with one sort of monolithic file and you work downwards. So you start with your major forms and then you add individual components and you get smaller and smaller and more intricate and then you can add your own sub-assemblies and individual files within that. Similarly, you can still do it all parametrically with a table built into the original assembly file itself and this is largely how Fusion operates. The problem though is that top-down is difficult. I mean, it is really difficult and the reason why is because it's very easy to create accidental dependencies on parts very, very early on. Similarly, it's very easy to have a part that maybe needs to change early on in the assembly, but then as the design progresses and you have more and more layers and more parts and everything, you then need to go back and change it. The program will have to recalculate everything again. And that becomes very, very resource intensive. The issue with having only 10 active documents at once is that I think it's just going to push you purely towards top down, which for beginners is going to be very difficult to manage, especially if their projects start getting a little bit larger and more ambitious. Having a really solid bottom up approach first, I think is essential to be able to manage a top down approach because it teaches you how to divide components, how to sort of manage larger assemblies and assess individual parts of a larger assembly, all of which are much more difficult in a top down system. So whilst Fusion might be designed with top-down in mind, this particular change isn't going to help enthusiasts get to learn that because it basically blocks off the bottom-up approach. And that is a problem. 
Now the next one is another pretty big one and that's the removal of the simulation environment for the personal license and I think it's a big shame because this actually was a proper advanced feature and the fact that it was available to everyone no matter your license I thought was fantastic. It opened up an incredible world of education to people even if you're not studying at an institution and that's a big thing. Whilst the, obviously the educational licenses are unaffected by these changes and it's only the personal ones, a lot of people do learn on the personal licenses, especially if you're maybe not any longer studying at an institution, you don't have access to those sorts of resources any longer. Having access to a piece of software that's this powerful for free is incredible. And it's a real shame that that has been locked away now because it really is an eye opener if you're able to start producing things at home on your own machines, printing, CNC machining, in your own garages, in your homes, and then being able to actually analyze these things and tweak designs and really learn the process. That's an amazing tool for crafting new engineers and people who are fascinated in the field regardless of their age and where they're currently residing. So to have that locked away again I think is a bit of a shame. Now the changes to the drawing systems and only being able to do a single active drawing, again that comes back to a very similar idea as the 10 active documents thing in that it just limits the scope of what you're able to do and again that's a little bit of a shame but it's less crucial than the others. Again I don't want to see any features removed, it does go against the principles that I run with but it's not completely ruined and you can still do some pretty impressive things and even my own work I tend to work with at most a single drawing. In regards to exporting as DXFs and things, um, again you can export from within the program. In fact actually it's always better from what I've seen. In fact if you're able to export anything from within the program, personally choose that option because the exporter for Fusion is rubbish. Like, I mean it is terrible for some reason. The cloud version just never works as well as the local one. So if you have that option I honestly suggest always choose that where possible. And now we come to the cam changes and these do rile me up a little bit. So the first one is the removal of automatic tool changes. Now yeah, okay, fine. Automatic tool changes are a fairly advanced feature, but that said, a lot of people now, funnily enough, do run machines with an element of an automatic tool changer. They may not have the full automatic capability, but they may use the call for an automatic tool change, uh, specifically to go to a part of the bed or to be able to swap things out manually. So actually removing that feature might well disrupt an awful lot of G code, and it's really quite frustrating. I don't really agree that that should have been removed because it was already there to begin with. It's not like they've added the feature midway through, it was always there, don't lock it away. Same thing goes for the ability to do rapids between parts. That's a crucial part of machining, it takes a long time if you can't rapid between parts. If you're going to be having to do the same high feed rate parts between everything, you're going to have to end up fiddling around with your g-code and export to try and make it so that your speed is as high as possible between your operations which in itself seems a bit risky and I just don't like the idea that's a basic feature that's something which is present on all of the home CNC machines be able to rapid between parts and do things quicker it's going to make cycle times vastly longer and I don't know why, it's not cloud integrated, it's just another gatekeeping feature. So I think they should remove that, that should be part of the original package because it was always there. Again it doesn't affect me directly because I pay for my license, but I'd be really angry if that was changed halfway through and I've gotten used to doing things and now I have to change everything because they've just locked something away for no reason. Now a lot of these changes come down to one aspect of Fusion that I absolutely hate and that is the biggest turn off for me which is the amount of cloud reliance. So if there's one thing that was definitely shown during this recent lockdown period is the fact that the internet here in the UK can be quite shaky. If everyone gets on at once lots of things go down and that really affected me because it meant that I actually at times couldn't access all of my files. I couldn't even log in, I couldn't save, I couldn't do lots of things within Fusion. 
and that's a bloody problem. Now, some of this you can negate by doing local backups and things like that. But then there are lots of features that are just built into Fusion that are increasingly cloud reliant. Like I have no idea why they've made it so that you have to use the cloud to export certain file types. Seemingly, the only reason to do that is to be able to put gates in the way. There are things that just don't need cloud translation at all. Why do you need the cloud to be able to say it's an STL outside of the regular format when you can do it from right clicking a model? There is a local exporter, so why is there a cloud one? That's the default. It should be the other way around. You should be able to choose to use the cloud where it benefits you. Now, one thing that Autodesk did make quite clear was that they wanted to be able to continue to offer the software for free, but of course, with that come related costs, and these changes were to help minimize those costs. The thing is though, there is a definite elephant in the room here in that, Integrating things via the cloud directly costs you money. So if you're going to have everyone constantly save their files by default to your servers, they're going to use your servers to translate every single thing in your software. You're paying for all of that compute time, for all that storage. These seem like a very easy area to just trim the fat, so to speak. Make it local. You don't need to have these being cloud features a lot of the time. I quite like the idea that you can have the cloud features. So being able to keep my tool libraries on the cloud, for instance, is great because I can transfer machines such as the NUC down here that I control my CNC from. I can then open Fusion up on that and then use the tool libraries on there. I think that's a great use of the cloud. Similarly, being able to host files online and then share them around very easily via the cloud I think is a great feature but I don't think it needs to be the default feature you can easily make it an opt-in or something that you might want to pay for even if it's just a nominal fee so I don't mind paying my full license fee and having access to that but I actually don't want it to be my default because it makes everything slower it takes me several minutes at times to close fusion because it's busy uploading my files to the cloud and quite frankly I don't care if they go on the cloud or not because I'm only using my files on a single seat with just me and I haven't got a team who needs to cooperate with me. So I'd actually much rather have the efficiency of just saving locally to my M2 SSDs running at PCIe 4 speed versus my shoddy upload connection via Virgin Media to some server in the middle of goddamn nowhere. It's not the first time I've had this issue either because generative design is almost entirely cloud-based. Again, for not much reason other than, from my perspective, to put up a paywall. And I'd much rather it just be available so I can just lock up my system maybe for a few days and push out some generations instead of having to pay to go through their servers and use their processing time. Now, I'm even quite happy to use mine to make a fairly rough model that's a bit further along than what you get from the preview currently and then do a really high resolution one using their servers and pay using the cloud credit system. That is fine. Same thing with rendering. I'm okay with rendering locally and then using cloud rendering for like a huge giant one that would benefit from having a full on supercomputer essentially doing it rather than locking my machine up for ages. But I want to have that choice. And ultimately having that choice also just makes it cheaper to run for them. So it's a bit of a shame that they've gone the route of integrating so many features into the cloud because to me, they just sound like features that they're intending to lock away in the future or put behind successive paywalls, which comes back to the point about trust, because it really is eroding it by using these methods. Now, I will mention that Autodesk has actually gotten in touch as well to be able to chat about this, so I'm looking forward to having a proper meetup with them and discussing and giving my feedback on it and seeing what they have to say. Either way, it should be interesting, and I'd like to know what you guys think and how it's going to affect you as well, because I can see this affecting people very widely because everyone has a different use case for the software. So I'll be really interested to see how this affects you. Well, hopefully that's helped everyone get up to speed with things. Remember, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, definitely do that. We've got so much stuff around the corner. I'm actually going to be using these ball screws when I get them in the machine eventually, and you want to see what those are going to be creating, that's for sure. You can also find us over on Facebook, Instagram, builds.gg and Twitter. 
Also, if you have any thoughts about the whole Autodesk situation, I definitely implore you to go and join our Discord and have a chat over there. I'd love to hear what you have to say about it, as well as any thoughts about what they should be doing, in your opinion. I think it's an interesting discussion, so definitely get in and get involved. And of course, whilst you're here, don't forget we also have our merchandise store linked below, so if you'd like to support the channel, have a browse through there and see if anything strikes your fancy. Take care, folks, and I'll catch you next time.